In this video, we're going to prove something kind of similar to what we did in the last video. So given that we have two functions, f and g, where both functions have limits as x tends towards c, which are equal to l and m respectively, we now define another function, h, where h of x is equal to f of x times g of x. And so now what I want to prove in this video is that the limit as x tends towards c for h of x is equal to l times m. So this is what I'm going to prove in this video. So in order to prove this, I need to establish the epsilon delta definition. So what I need to establish is that for whatever value of epsilon that you come up with, there will always exist a value of delta larger than zero, such that if x is within a distance of delta away from c, then this immediately implies that h of x will be within a distance of epsilon away from l times m. So this is, will be smaller than epsilon. So this is the statement we need to establish in this video. So in order to establish our proof, what we need to do is to show that if x is sufficiently close to c, then this expression over here can be made arbitrarily small. So first of all, we're going to first focus on this h of x minus l times m term. So I'm going to man manipulate this term a bit. So h of x by definition is equal to f of x times g of x. And then I'm going to manipulate this f of x term by expressing it as f of x minus l plus l. So since you're subtracting and adding l, it doesn't change anything, so it's perfectly valid for me to do this. And then I can do the same thing for g. So for g of x, I subtract this by m and then add this by m, so that the net effects, they cancel out. So this entire expression is now expressed in such a way. And then now I'm going to break apart these brackets. So first of all, we have this f of x minus l times g of x minus m term. So that's this term multiplied by this term. Second of all, we have m times f of x minus l. And the third of all, we have l times g of x minus m. And then we have a plus lm and then a minus lm. So eventually, these two expressions will cancel each other out. So in the end, we're left with something like this. And then don't forget in that in this expression over here, there's an absolute value sign. So I'm going to add an absolute value sign. And then now I'm going to invoke the triangle inequality, something which I've done in the past two videos. So in case you don't remember, the triangle inequality states that a absolute value of a plus b is always smaller than or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b. So here you see we have three separate expressions uh, that are added together. So it's kind of like uh, applying the triangle inequality two times. So in that case, we get something like this entire expression is always smaller than or equal to the absolute value of f of x minus l and then times the absolute value of g of x minus m. So that's the first expression. And the second of all, we have plus the absolute value of m times the absolute value of f of x minus l. And third of all, we have this absolute value of l times the absolute value of g of x minus m. So you see for this entire expression, if you go back to the conditions of the situation that we're dealing with, we know that both f and g have limits as x tends towards c. So if x is made sufficiently close to c, then these terms f of x minus l and g of x minus m, which are expressions that come up with the epsilon delta definitions of these two limits, we can actually make these terms over here. We can make these terms arbitrarily small if we make x sufficiently close to c. And we know we can do that because we know that these two limits exist. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you the mathematical details behind how we can uh, how we can constrain the values of x so that we can make this entire expression arbitrarily small. So now what I'm going to do is that first of all we know that these two limits exist. So what that means is that for whatever value of epsilon that you come up with, I know first of all I know for sure that there exists a value called delta one such that if x minus c is smaller than delta 1, that this implies that f of x minus l is smaller than the square root of epsilon over 3. So this is kind of similar to what we did, uh, what we have done in the past two videos. So it's, uh, if you're in case you're wondering, it's perfectly fine for me to add this uh, square root sign and to divide this term by 3. No matter how I change this, I know that I will always be able to find a corresponding delta such that this entire conditional statement holds. So it's perfectly fine if I manipulate this term in such a way. And you'll see in the end how this choice of epsilon will eventually help us uh, construct the epsilon delta definition for this function, for this expression. And so this is 
one thing that we know because we know that the function f does have a limit as x tends towards c and then we also know that if we make there does exist a number delta 2 such that if x minus c is smaller than delta 2 then that will imply that g of x minus m is smaller than the, epsilon, the, the square root of epsilon over 3. Once again we know that this delta always exists because the uh, limit of g of x exists as x tends towards c so we know that there will always be a value delta such that this expression is true. And then we do the same thing again. Now this time we're going to change the expression a little so in this case we know that there must exist a value delta 3 such that f of x minus l is smaller than epsilon divided by 3 times 1 plus the absolute value of m. So you might be wondering why I've chosen this term to be, su uh, to be such a way. So this 1 plus over here is to prevent the case when m is equal to 0. And we can do the same thing once again. So I know that there must exist a value called delta 4 such that if x minus c is smaller than delta 4, then I know that g of x minus m is smaller than epsilon divided by 3 times 1 plus the absolute value of l. Once again, this 1 over here is uh, placed here in the denominator to prevent the case when l is equal to 0. So if l and m are equal to 0 and I don't have this 1, this entire term won't make any sense. So that's to prevent that from happening. And so now with all these symbols defined, now I'm going to define another symbol called delta. Now delta is going to be the minimum of delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and delta 4. So I hope by the, at this point you'll recognize that these steps are kind of similar to what we have done in the past two videos. So now, since delta is defined in such a way, if, if our value of x is within a distance of delta away from c, then since delta is the minimum of delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and delta 4, in this case, x would be a number such that all four of these conditions are satisfied. So it immediately implies that these four statements are true. So if delta is defined in such a way, then if x minus c is smaller than delta, then it implies that all of these expressions are true. Now this is going to be something that we're going to use to construct our proof. So now at this point we're ready to construct our epsilon delta definition. So now I'm going to state that for whatever value of epsilon that you come up with, now I'm going to define delta to be a number that's equal to the minimum of delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and delta 4, with delta 1, 2, 3, 4 defined in such a way. And then now we're going to see what happens if x is within a distance of delta away from c. Now we're going to see what this implies. So what we want to do is to show that if this condition is satisfied, then this h of x minus l times m can be made arbitrarily small. So h of x minus l times m, we know from all this work over here that h of x minus l times m is always smaller than or equal to, so let me just write this down. So this entire term is always smaller than or equal to, so I'll write it a bit more to the left to give myself some space. It's always smaller than or equal to, first of all, l times g of x minus m, so that's this expression over here, and we also have an m times f of x minus l, so plus m times f of x minus l, and then we also have a third term, so that was this term, and then now we have f of x minus l times uh, g of x minus m. And so now we know that since delta is defined in such a way, it's equal to the minimum of delta 1, 2, 3, 4. And since now we know that uh, x minus c is smaller than delta, so now we know that these four statements are true. So first of all, we know that f of x minus l is smaller than epsilon divided by 3, uh, times 1 plus the absolute value of m. So this entire expression is smaller than, so let's, so the first expression is g of x expression, so we know that g of x is smaller than this expression, so this is always smaller than the absolute value of l times epsilon divided by 3 times 1 plus the absolute value of l. So you see that this expression is just this expression over here. And we do the same thing over here. So once again, since we know x minus c is smaller than delta, then we know that f of x minus l is going to be smaller than this expression. So now we have epsilon divided by 3 times 1 plus the absolute value of m. And then now for these two expressions, once again, since x minus c is smaller than delta, we know that both of these expressions will be smaller than epsilon divided by 3. So we have epsilon divided by 3 times epsilon divided by 3. 
So now let's rearrange this expression a bit. So this expression can be rearranged. So first of all, we have epsilon over 3. I'm going to pull that out. And then we have the absolute value of L divided by 1 plus the absolute value of L. Notice that this entire term, this entire term is always smaller than or equal to 1. So this entire term is always smaller than or equal to 1. And same goes for this term. We can do the exact same thing. We have epsilon over 3 times the absolute value of M divided by 1 plus the absolute value of M. Once again, this term is always smaller than or equal to 1. And then now we have this term, so plus uh, the square root of epsilon over 3 multiplied by itself, so we have epsilon over 3. And since these two terms are always smaller than or equal to 1, we can say that this entire term is always smaller than or equal to epsilon over 3 times 1. And we can do the same thing for this term, so we just have epsilon over 3, and this term doesn't change, so we have epsilon over 3, and we see that this entire term is always equal to epsilon. So what we've shown is that we can indeed find a value of delta. So for whatever value of epsilon you choose, we see that there does indeed exist a value of delta, such that if x minus c is smaller than delta, then h of x minus l times m can be smaller than epsilon. So it is always smaller than epsilon. So no matter what value of epsilon I choose, I can always find a value of delta, such that if x is sufficiently close to c, then h of x minus uh, can be made arbitrarily close to l, minus, uh, l times m. So uh, this is an important result, obviously, and one alternative way to express this result, so so far we've expressed it as the limit of h of x is equal to l times m. Another way to express this, of course, is to write h of x as f times g, so to show that this function is defined as the outputs of f and g multiplied together is equal to l times m. I, I uh, forgot to show you the same thing in the last video, so the last video was about the addition of functions, so similarly in that video you could have expressed the theorem in the previous video in such a way. So instead of using h of x you can use the function of f plus g and in this video we have the function of f times g. And also another way to express this result is to write the limit as x tends to c of f of x times g of x to be equal to the limit as x tends towards c of f of x times the limit as x tends towards c of g of x which is equal to L times M. So this is just alternative ways to express the same thing.